Hello again, statisticians here with a little re linear regression recap. Uh, I'm just going to work right off of our, our uh, note sheet on this. And um, so I'll just go through and hopefully this answers some of your questions and, and uh, again, bring any other questions that you have back to me and we'll, we'll work from there. So to start here, we've got, again, the scatter plot that comes from Excel. Um, really don't, don't pay too much attention to the formula on there. But, it, but uh, the scatter plot is where this, really the root of this unit is, is, um, you know, uh, one of the points, again, we start off when we see a scatter plot is direction, form, and strength. And direction, of course, is, is it going up? Is it positive? Or is it negative? Uh, form is really, is it linear or nonlinear? And that, again, we, we learn from the residual plot if it's linear or nonlinear, which we'll get to in a little bit. And then strength is really, is it strong, moderate, or weak? And that uh, both direction and strength we get to with correlation. Um, so when we have a scatter plot, we can create a least squares regression line, what you probably have known as a line of best fit for the through your algebra years. Um, each one of those has an independent and dependent variable, as you saw back when you first worked on scatter plots, probably years ago. Um, we did see, however, that we do have a little different form of the equation in this in statistics. Um, first of all, there's the hat over that y, and the hat again means predicted. Okay, so you do have to remember that there's a hat over that y that stands for predicted, um, which again is just recognizing the fact that we're using a, a line of best fit. We're not using a line that touches every point, okay? This line isn't hitting the points. Um, it's just predicting, based off the overall collection of points, what the Y value would be on average at a given X, okay? So in the year uh, 2005, this is what we expect the Y to be as a predicted value. Um, of course, that's not the actual Y value that we see in that model. Um, and then, the x again is the independent variable. And then we have our two constants. We have a, which is the y-intercept. And again, the y-intercept is just as you would have known it or thought about it years ago, except we have to add that word predicted in there. Okay. Um, and so predicted here is just is highlighting the fact that um, that it's with that hat that we don't have the exact value. And so the predicted value when x equals zero. So it might be, again, if it's height and weight, um, if it's height and weight, it might be that the, the uh, let's see, so as it's crossing here, um, as a height is zero inches, our predicted weight is this, whatever that happens to be. My model's a little bit off because typically in these models, predicted weight ends up being like negative 150 pounds because of extrapolation. But um, but that's our predicted Y value when X equals zero. And then slope again, slope we know as change in Y over change in X. We typically look at it as over one. And so the slope is, you know, as our height increases by one inch, our predicted weight increases by five pounds on average. Okay, so the keys there are predicted and on average. And again, that's something where the, the common question with these is interpret slope and intercept in context. And so you just need to remember to use all those pieces, the on average, the predicted and so forth. Okay, now the whole bottom part here is all about strength. Okay, and uh, with correlation, there's direction as well. So again, correlation, um, a perfect correlation of one is just a, a line of points that goes straight uphill. Negative one is a line of points that goes straight downhill. It doesn't matter if the slope is negative 0.01 or negative 1 million. Anything that goes downhill in a straight line is negative one. And then a slope of zero would be like when there's just no relationship between the points. Okay, um, and we can't just put a line through that's that uh, we can see where the model is here. Of course, you can... You might argue that our line goes like this, but it could go like this, could go like this, and that's what causes a, a correlation to be closer to zero. Um, again, correlations go from negative one to one. Use this little uh, spectrum here. Um, uh, a slope or a correlation of one is no better or worse than a correlation of negative one. It just depends on the context. 
um, correlation of zero would mean that the points just have no connection at all. Um, and then it goes from weak to strong. And, and then again, we have this kind of, this is my own creation here of how I break down strong, moderate, and weak. Um, again, moderate, I would split in half and have the upper half be moderately strong and the lower half be moderately weak uh, when it comes to, um, for instance, 0.33 to 0.5 would be moderately weak and 0.5 to 0.67 would be moderately strong. Uh, so correlation, really all you have to say about correlation is uh, there is a strong positive relationship between uh, distance traveled to work and number of speeding tickets. You know, whatever it happens to be, you just have to give the strength and direction. And then just lastly, correlation only works when we have uh, linear relationships. Uh, if it's not linear, correlation really is not very helpful. Um, and then correlation is also very, and we don't, it's not resistant in the same way we've talked about resistant in the past, but it's, you can't really change correlation unless you add, remove, or move a point. Um, you, if you change height, uh, from inches to centimeters and weight from pounds to Z scores, that's not going to change your correlation. The only way you'd change it is if you actually added or removed a point or you moved a point in your data set. Uh, finally, coefficient of determination from the front page of the note sheet here, uh, coefficient of determination, R squared, it's the ugly definition. Um, just a quick reminder of what it is. Um, if we have a pretest and a post test, and we've got these points, and these are each, each one of these represents one of your scores, and the correlation between these is 0 0.6. So that's a moderately strong positive correlation between pretest and post test. That means the R squared is 0.36. And what we would say then here is, looking over at our definition, th about 36% of the variation in the post-test scores can be explained, and I just didn't, don't say the word that, can be explained by the linear relationship between pretest and post-test score. Okay, once again, about 36% of the variation in the post-test scores can be explained by the linear relationship between pretest and post-test scores. Um, again, if there's any labels in there, if it's height and weight, you can put inches and pounds and things in there. But um, what that means is our line is generally capturing that this is an uphill trend. It's a positive trend, um, kind of the rate at which it goes, but it's not capturing all these points above and below. And, and you know, it's not going all over here to, to capture all those. Okay. And so what we're missing is you know, the people up here probably studied more or listened or took more notes or things like that. Our model's not capturing that because it's just looking at the pretest score. Okay, it's not capturing that these people maybe did a little less work. And so we're not capturing that because it's just based off your pretest score. So you have this kind of theoretical 64%, which is 100 minus the 0.36. Um, and, or 36%. And that 64% then would be any other factors that are influencing your post-test score, which would be like I said, studying, uh, uh, taking notes, listening, things like that. Um, so R squared, typical question for R squared is just interpret the R squared value. Okay. On to the back page. Okay, back page is a little quicker here. Um, and the first thing we have on the back page is residual values. Okay, so for residual values, um, Again, a residual value is this vertical distance. Okay, any point above the line has a positive residual. Any point below the line has a negative residual. Okay, we could start to talk about what that means in each one. You know, in a, in a lot of cases, probably most cases, you generally want to have a positive residual value. Um, maybe in golf, you want to have a negative residual value if that means you're scoring lower than expected. Um, but residuals, most common mistake I see with residuals is students uh, accidentally putting them backward. Predicted minus observed instead of observed minus predicted. Just remember alphabetical order, which is Y minus Y hat. So typical question here is to find the re determine the residual. And what they would do is they would give you a point, let's say the point two five, and they'd give you a model, a formula that's maybe uh, one plus three uh, X. Okay, so you would literally put the x in for the x there. That's our 2. And so, oops, 1 plus. So that equals 7. So our residual here would be the observed y of 5, okay, minus the y hat of 7. So our residual would be a negative 2. 
Um, that would just mean that our point was vertically on the y-axis two value two units below the line, um, and that's the same x value. Um, you won't have to find a bunch of residuals ever. Uh, regular question is is you know to calculate one, or then it moves on to the residual plots. And a residual plot then is taking the same x coordinates as we had, same x values that we had in the original model and replacing the y value with just the residual for that point. Okay, so instead of the point two five here, we would be graphing the point two negative two because that's the x and this is the residual value. Okay, and you would do that for every single point and you won't have to do that for every single point. Um, but uh, ultimately the residual value should add up to zero because that's what a line of best fit is. It makes the residuals add up to zero. Okay, again, least squares regression line was about essentially squaring all of these residuals and having it be the shortest line possible. So it's like each one of these little red lines here is a, a string, and we take that string and tie them end to end, and it should never get shorter than it will with a with a line of best fit or, or a least squares regression line. Um, least squares is, again, minimizing the sum of the squared residuals, which is just these values squared to make them all positive. Um, since they always add up to zero if you keep them, the negative ones negative. Okay, so residual plots. What do you want in a residual plot? You want scatter. Okay, a scattered residual plot tells us that the model is linear or that our linear model is appropriate. In each one of the instances here, there is a little issue. This is, a, this is our closest to being a positive. Okay, there is scatter there, which suggests that our linear model is appropriate. Um, the little issue that we do have here is the residuals are getting bigger. Um, and with the residuals getting bigger, that means that there's something goofy about the model that as the X increases, the values start to get more sporadic, okay? Um, which is uh, could be an issue, but it's certainly still the best of these three. This one here, somebody, there's a mistake here um, that somebody put an original scatter plot on a residual plot. And how we know that is, there's no reason that we get a bunch of negatives and then a bunch of positives, okay? That just means that the line, if these are our points, somebody drew the line like this, okay? And just missed it completely. So this would never happen, never should happen here, okay? This one here is the most common um, issue that we see, which is the idea that the points originally were not a straight line. So when we drew our line of best fit in there, we got positive residuals, then negative residuals, then positive residuals, okay? And so what that is, is that's gonna create this sort of smiley face of, uh, of a residual plot, or it could be a frowny face if it's going, if it's plateauing the other way. Um, and the issue there then would be that, that our linear model is not appropriate. We should be bringing in logarithms to, to fix that, okay? Um, so what you want complete scatter. Uh, finally, a couple last things, extrapolation. Extrapolation, again, is the idea that if we have a domain of values for our model, like in this situation right there, the domain is about 20 to 70. That means we should use this model to make predictions from 20 to 70. We shouldn't make it to make a prediction about what's going to happen at 100 degrees in that case. Um, and so you uh, businesses may do that uh, because they got to do some predictive modeling. But uh, typically, uh, they're going to do a lot more work than just a regular scatter plot in a line. So, so they have a little more trustworthy approach. But in general, you do not want to make predictions outside of your domain. Um, that's called extrapolation. Confounding variables would just be any other variable that's influencing our results. Um, this happens a lot of times in education when we talk about test scores, uh, like uh, ACT or MCA test scores. We say, you know, you trace it back to this one variable. And that variable could be socioeconomic, it could be ethnicity, it, uh, um, it could be something about uh, courses or grades or levels of things that you've taken. And, and some of those may play a role, and, and many of them may play a role, but, but when you start to say that one of them is the indicator, um, you're not considering the confounding variables of what else causes um, you know, struggles in that situation other than just the variable you're looking at. So confounding variables like lurking variables, just other things that are influencing our results. And finally, influential points. Influential points are things like this, where we have a model, and then all of a sudden we put in one point up here, okay? Um, 
that point is going to cause our model to go from here to maybe something like this, okay? Something that starkly changes our model. Sometimes it changes us from a negative to a positive slope, okay? Um, or vice versa. Um, it's it, You see some other terminology, okay? The, at the center of this line is the point X bar, Y bar, okay? And so any point that really, that, that's kind of the fulcrum of our teeter-totter, any point that doesn't go the same direction as points generally do from there, um, has it can have an influence now that's a little different this is this you could call this an outlier too but again if it's if it's right say right here if i erase that and put it right here um then technically it aligns with other y's and it aligns with other x's okay um right here and right here okay but uh um so it's not i guess technically an outlier from other points, but it's outlying to the other values near it and it's influential. Okay, so influential just means it's gonna change our model. Look, things that you look for to change with influential is the y-intercept, the slope, the r or r squared values. Okay, so you might get the question of if a point is influential, these are the areas you're looking for, is does it change those values? And again, what, what, what uh, would probably happen there is you get the computer printout and you're looking at the the two leftmost values that are A and B that we have on our computer printout sheet. Um, and then the R squared values on the computer printout as well. Um, so that would make it influential. Um, the other term you might see is leverage point, which is a, a term for, you know, if it's on way to the left or way to the right of the X bar, Y bar point, um, and a leverage point is something that would sway that teeter totter one direction or the other. So, um, so keep that in mind. Um, but that is that is all right now for linear regression. Again, if this prompts any other questions, please just let me know. Thank you. Bye-bye.